This is the last stretch for today. What's going to happen is we have one unified panel presentation now. By the way, I'm very pleased to see how many people have signed up on the participatory sessions. Because after this panel presentation, we have a lightning session, which means half of the people who have been selected to show posters are going to talk very briefly about their posters so we have an idea what their posters are on. Then we're going to have time to mingle and drink and look at posters. Then we have free time for lunch, for dinner, sorry, for dinner. And then we have the crazy participatory sessions experiment for those of you who have the stomach to come back. Which is all of you, right? Except those who have children and have a good excuse. Now, uh, to introduce the panel, this is a very exciting panel. It's the micro, macro, nano panel. And let me introduce all the people who are going to be involved in this presentation. First of all, the moderator for this session will be our very own Randy Sargent. Randy. <laughs> Famously built the first GigaPan mechanism. Uh, he is co-principal investigator of the Global Connection Project. He's co-principal investigator of GigaPan, and he's co-chair of this conference. So we're very pleased that he's with us, and he's a joint appointment between Carnegie Mellon University as research faculty and at NASA Ames uh, Research Center. The panelists to my left, I'll briefly introduce them. Uh, it's difficult to be brief because they all have fantastic backgrounds. I'm going to start, I think, on the far left. Uh, on the far left, we have Jay Longson, and he's an electrical engineering doctoral student at the University of California, Santa Cruz. His research focus is on carbon nanotube thermal in in interface materials, and he's conducting that research at the NASA Ames Research Center. And uh, he helped to develop the micro gigapan system, and you're going to hear all about that right now. To his right, we have Rich Gibson. Rich Gibson is a Perl database programmer in Santa Rosa. He's worked professionally with computers since 1982, and uh, his current fascination is creating tools to aid in the acquisition, management, and presentation of information with a geographic component. Um, he actually has a lot of interesting side projects as well. One of them is that he dives for abalone and halibut in his free time. Um, and abalone is not easy to dive for, at least in the South African part of the world that I know. To his right, we have Gene Cooper. Gene Cooper is an interactive technology artist exploring relationships between the natural systems of the body and ecology. His work includes new photographic technologies, interactive exhibitry for science centers, panoramic virtual tour products for national parks, interactive installations, and performances. He's the owner of Four Chambers Studio, which has been a collaborator with us on all of this work in the area of micro gigapanography. And to his right, we have Richard Palmer. Richard Palmer is one of our fine fellows, and he's employed by the Hawaii State Department of Health. His background is in natural resources management and botany, and he has an interest in GigaPan. Ever since the pilot phase of the project started, he's been one of us. Um, I also need to say about Richard that he is a very, very well-performing artist, and you can see his work in numerous locations, and we, are, we have the benefit that once in a great while, he'll actually give us some of his artwork, and it's great for us to receive uh, real artwork from a real artist. So that's Richard. And to his right, we have John Rollins. John Rollins is a, a fellow who has a diverse background as well. I guess it's hard to introduce these people. He was raised on a sheep ranch in eastern Oregon. That was important that you know that. He's the curator <laughs> of invertebrate uh, zoology. Uh, and he's an entomologist at the Carnegie Museum of Natural History. And his research interests are particularly on the morphology and phylogeny of Lepidoptera and the use of insects as indicator systems for habitat conservation and resource management. Uh, he has done numerous projects with Carnegie Mellon University and with the National Science Foundation through the Carnegie Museums of Natural History as the principal investigator. So with that, I welcome Randy Sargent to run the panel. Well, thanks everyone for, for being here. Thanks to the panel. Thanks, thanks to all of you. <coughs> you know, Sitting in front of the gigapixel image, whether it's printed on the, the wall or on a computer screen, and, and zooming in and really, really going and exploring it, it's a little bit like being teleported to another place. You get the sense of immersion, and suddenly you're there. You sit in front of a gigapixel image of Mount Everest, and suddenly you're on Mount Everest. In front of Mars, and suddenly you're on Mars. Well, what, what, what does it mean to take a gigapixel image of something super, super tiny, a bug, you know, or even, even a biotone? But I, I can say, having, having played with the images these guys have, have put together, you know, it's, it's every bit as exciting an alien as a Mars. So uh, let, me, let me start with, the, uh, with Richard Palmer. Uh, he took 
some of the very, very first pictures at VeganCamp.org of tiny things. And he uh, developed a really interesting technique with a standard VeganCam device, but with uh, putting special lenses on, on his camera. He'll talk a little bit about that now. He also is running a session uh, later tonight. So thanks, Richard. Sure. Well, geez. I don't know about really tiny things, but at least the collection. Uh, let's see, where's the very, very first macro panorama that I took? When I first got the pilot unit, it was the side of the shed in my landlord's backyard. Uh, so it was to challenge the definition of a panorama. And that's what I try to do on most of what I do, most of my work, is challenging the definitions of uh, panoramas and other uh, types of art. So you can go anywhere on, on this uh, shed and, and you get some interesting images. And I call it portal because it reminded me, since this is an old playhouse, of a portal to your childhood. <coughs> And this was taken with the, the pilot unit and an old Canon G7 at the maximum zoom. So this was not a macro setup per se, but it's not a broad-based panorama as most people are used to. So this is my first foray in, into that. Um, as I'm a botanist, uh, I do take images of things botanical. Uh, this is on the edge of a trail in back of Honolulu. Um, and let's see. These are mosses, liverworts, and hornworts. But there's one particular, particularly interesting little organism in there. And can you see the little white square up on the top? Until you search it, you have no idea what you might find on an, any panorama or any high resolution image. And just searching around, I found this little native fly. So. Um, and you can find other things like uh, sporangia of uh, hornworts, or liverworts, and sporangia of hornworts, and other funny, crazy things there. And that was taken with the early units with a little bridge point and shoot with a couple little attachments to it. And I'll be showing this at, at my session at 8 o'clock. So be there. <laughs> um, I enjoy doing things that uh, have, are artistic for their own purpose. So this is still life with chocolate. Uh, and this was my first attempt at multifocal plane. Uh, photography. Uh, so I'll let here. I, I have to get a plug in. <laughs> That's where I work. And you know, sometimes you just have to, to sit back and contemplate. <laughs> oh, somebody finally got it. <laughs> and there are, there are other ways to, to have lots of fun. This is, um, this is for dinner tonight. Anyone who wants some pepperoni? Okay, what the heck. This is my latest 
attempt, my latest effort. This is uh, still life with dental floss. <laughs> and I took multiple focal planes and tried to merge them together. But they were slightly misaligned. So there are a few places in, in the image that have good focus. And one of the, since I'm a native Pittsburgher, and I can remember exactly what I was doing on October 13th, 1960. Um, those of you who remember, uh, this is an autographed ball from the 1960 Pirates. And how many out there know who Bill Mazeroski is? Okay, there are a few of you. Good. Uh, that was one of the clear, clear planes uh, in the image. So I thought that was nice. But as you can see, um, because it was a little misaligned, it looks like it's shrink wrapped in plastic. I'm going to try to fix that a little bit, but we'll see. Still life with sake. And for this one, just to, to show you, oops. this is the full depth of still life with sake. Uh, and you can see my connection with the area here. But I also made, this is the first layer of the eight <coughs> layers that I used. And you can zoom in and see that the back of the image is still fairly out of focus. Oh, sorry. I thought my voice carried enough. I guess not. This is a, a combination of three <coughs> different panoramas that I took. One to show context of the painting in an art gallery. And by the way, I did have permission to take this. Uh, and this is just to show the um, isolated painting. And you can see how far in and the detail that you can find. And then I just took a very small part the, the, where the two feet touch in the painting. And zoomed in very close. And that was with a bridge point and shoot, the Canon S5, and a couple of ta attachments to the lens. Okay, that's as far as it'll go. Uh, but you can, if you go in a little closer, you can see that the strands of canvas are made out of smaller fibers. So that's it for me. I hope I set up.
So Gene has been working on, on uh, another generation of devices for capturing these very detailed uh, pictures. Uh, in fact, the, uh, the device you see over on the, on the right is, uh, is his. He's going to be talking a little bit more about the focus stacking that Richard Palmer has been talking about. And instead of maybe taking three at a time, maybe taking 10 or 20 at some, in some cases. Thanks, Randy, and thanks for uh, having us out here and everything. I had uh, started, uh, I had started this sort of work um, kind of independently, but over the last couple of years, we've been working together, and now have really been seeing some great progress. So we hope to show you a few things that we have going on right now, and, and get your input on kind of the next steps that you would like to see in what we're building. So. Uh, what we're really after here is enabling new science and discovery through microscopic giga gigapixel imaging. So the ch there are a few different challenges. We have uh, myself, Randy, Jay, Rich, and John here on, on this particular project um, and, uh, as a collaboration. So who are we? We're uh, uh, all of us up here, a number of extended collaborators and so forth. Um, and what is micro gigapan? So we've kind of come up with that term, trying to figure out uh, a good title for it. We're using micro gigapan. As a, so basically, it's a new technology that combines robotics systems, which seem to use excellent at imaging software, also an excellent at, and online sharing tools, also an excellent at. So um, we're kind of trying to combine these three different types of uh, uh, technologies into one sort of seamless system. So as John might mention a little bit later, John sort of posed to us, uh, I want to photograph my bug, and I want to press one button and see it on the website. So that's a big challenge, um, but that's what we're kind of trying to move towards. And, and I, first I thought, oh, there's no way we're going to be able to do that, but, but, but actually we're getting close to it. So. <clears throat> so this is a tool to create a seamless gigapixel image of an entire specimen at the micro microscopic level. So, so this is kind of an important distinction and we hope an important tool for scientists to use. That, that to be able to see the whole thing and have that level of resolution at the same time. So we want to enable this so that uh, re researchers can use it to make better discoveries. Uh, so that they can provide access to their content and provide a way of sharing that access through the online tools that kind of expands the way uh, things have been done before. Um, the online sharing is, I think, absolutely essential to making this work. So I think with that uh, element, the GigaPan has really pioneered, I think that uh, there's a lot of possibilities. So why are we, uh, why are we doing this and you know, what are the, some of the challenges? So, so Richard had sort of touched upon the fact of doing multifocus. And the reason we're doing multifocus is because through a standard image, right over here, that's all you see through one image through a microscope. And this isn't even a very high-powered microscope. So the farther in you zoom, the lower depth of field you get, and the even tinier bit that, that, you, that you see. So what we do is we capture a series of images. Rich will probably talk a little bit more about that. We capture a series of images that have different focus. We merge those together, and then we stitch them like a normal gigapan. So an example or two. So let me pop off here, and I'll show you an, uh, one or two examples here. So, so we've started a, a website called Small World Explorations uh, as kind of a portal. Uh, we're using it for, for applying for different grants to sort of show a few examples. We have lots of different information and examples, scanning electron microscope, and so forth, images up there. So I'm just going to show you uh, one or two here. This is one that uh, a little demo that we put together. And this is a butterfly from the Carnegie Museum. <clears throat> it's just a test specimen, really, just to, just to try this out. So basically, we can do like a normal gigapan. We can zoom in and zoom out. But this one is a little special, uh, and we can get pretty detailed in it. So this one's a little special because we photographed the front and the back of it. And we have it overlaid in a single viewer here at the same time. So I can go and increase the opacity of those layers and try to take a look at, OK, here are some markings on the front. What does it look like on the back? And we can see exactly what it looks like on the back. Um, so we can do some different uh, processes with those imagery 
in this format that are really exciting. And I think that the time lapse element that Randy and Hila and everyone has been working on is another element and tool that I, I'm really excited to see um, fold into the microscopic work as well. So we can do different layering and different uh, and show a lot of different tools that just weren't possible before. There's no way to view the front and back of the butterfly at a single time. And there's no way, even if you took a picture of it and you set them side by side, you're never going to be able to have that level of comparison to it. So this is a great tool. Uh, it's probably not the only tool, but it's one great tool, I think, that um, we can use to do that. So uh, I'm going to show one more example and then pass it over to, to Rich and Jay to talk a little bit more. So this is, uh, there's a number of different thoughts and specimens that we've thought about. This happened to be a eucalyptus leaf from my backyard. And I thought, well, this is really interesting. Let's take a look at that. So uh, you can do a lot of different things with lighting. So in this case, I photographed it with, from, by lighting it from underneath and by lighting it from above at the same time. So you can start to see the, um, the I guess you would call them the oils and, and so forth on the uh, surface of the eucalyptus leaf here. And then <clears throat> you can also get a sense of the vein structure there uh, from the lighting from behind it. And you, so you move around, you can see where the oils have been wiped off, what the vein structure is underneath it. So I think with some different lighting techniques, it starts to merge different views of a gigapan together uh, and, and to, to form something that might be a little bit more informative than your standard image. So, um, and in fact, you can see an example of this. This is uh, not an error in the image. That's actually the shadow from the flash. Uh, so this is a, a part of the leaf that is just lit from behind. And this is a part that's mostly lit from above. So uh, there's a lots of different examples. Um, we're looking at archival uses of, of this. So we have, uh, this is an image, I won't go into it, but this is an image of a 35 millimeter negative. So it's a, actually a three gigapixel image of a small 35 millimeter negative. So it might be a great archival use. Um, I have a young baby and we had a formula recall. And so, and they said, in, by in fact, uh, they have some bug parts in them. So I thought, oh, that's interesting. So, so uh, <laughs> I thought, well, given that we've handled the formula and everything, it may not be the, the, the scientific sample to test, but I wanted to see, could we detect anything in it? And sure enough, by lighting it from underneath, you could actually really start to see foreign matter in a hurry. So I don't know if these are bug parts or not, but they might have been dirt from our hands from handling the formula, but I think it's interesting that you can start to pick those things out. So, so and the last, uh, the last example I'll show is real short, and uh, I'll hand it over to Rich and Jay. Oh, I forgot to mention, so access and sharing. John will probably talk a little bit about this in terms of the work that he's been doing. Providing access to collections is, is I think, a really amazing opportunity here to start to share collections from different museums, from different research, and bring those together. So I want to say that I'm going to pop through a different other examples. These are a few of the different devices that we've set up here. Um, Rich is going to talk about a microscope enabled, uh, or a, um, an adapter kit that he's working on. Jay is working on a adapting existing microscopes. And then the imager that you see over here, that's what I've been working on. That's sort of a semi-adjustable and reconfigurable setup that can do objects as, as large as this to about two millimeters. So try to capture that range for different fossils. You can take it into the field, although it's a little cumbersome right now. But you can take it into the field and set it over something that you can't move and take back to the lab as an, as an idea there. So I'm going to forward on because I know we're a little uh, a little um, short on time. So this is a little diagram of the imager, and this is actually, we'll probably put this on the Small World Exploration site uh, for you to go into. But basically, you've got a motion control system that moves the camera in three different directions. You have a flash lighting system that I'm using to get a really sharp, crystal clear image without any vibration or without any movement and without having to wait for a long exposure. Um, we're looking at having a, a PlayStation 2 interface and so forth for 
quickly jogging around and setting your settings without looking at the computer. Um, and then it's got uh, an interface that we've set up to, which is actually a common interface between all of our work that will allow you to automate the process of taking the imagery that you need. So automating taking both the focus, different, the images at the different focus levels, and the imagery in the mosaic that comes together. So one thing I didn't mention is the number of images that we're usually doing. So this is, uh, I'm trying to remember what, how many images this is. This is roughly 3,500 images. The beetle that's on your um, um, uh, cover there, that was about five, uh, 55,000 images uh, that goes into that. Um, so it kind of spans, spans the gamut. Of course, you have errors that come up with uh, longevity of shutter, uh, sh shutter mechanisms and cameras and so forth, but I think those are things that we can work around. So I think the, there's a lot of different possibilities. It's really exciting. And <clears throat> we also photographed this next uh, very special subject. It's really exciting to see it. It's a new butterfly specimen that uh, I think John will be really excited to see, and with that, I'll end. <laughs> John, John or, uh, Gene has presented that subject before at uh, SIGGRAPH, where he headed the SIGGRAPH studio. He presented it as a special um, Cross between a conceptual and installation piece. It was a conceptual piece. Yeah. But was it? Con did you say conceptual and? It, it conceptual was, piece. Yeah. It was. Uh, that looks wrong. This looks right. Okay, so I'm tempted. Um, yeah, I have to. I, I have to. I can't. Uh, so we're looking at these tiny, tiny things, right? So it's really important to start by, um, as Richard says, challenging our assumptions. So this is actually a two centimeter in parts resolution image of the Burning Man Festival. So the least micro thing I could find. Okay, so what I have a passion for is changing the way we see so that we can make improvements to our world, to see the eternity of everything, to see the context, the full, the everything. Um, yesterday, with the equipment that you guys had, Sarangi took this beautiful image of the Amazon blanket, and you can zoom in. So even with the equipment you have, a la what Richard's doing, no special lenses, no nothing, you're looking at the fibers from this blanket. Uh, Mark Turin had a different view of the um, green building at the, uh, I'm sorry, I don't mean to snark, no, I mean it's, but his detail there was, was awesome. I mean, he saw something different. He said, how do we capture these images? How do we do this? And, and so um, Gabe came over and said, can you do this? Can we do it? And it's like, yeah, we should do it in the morning when we don't have the sun glare, but yeah, it was awesome. So my focus right now has been on how do we lower the cost of image acquisition for scientists, for students, for citizen science, and also look at these poor orphans. How, how many of you have microscopes that look kind of like this in corners of your labs? Yeah. And how many of you, the only reason you don't use them is you have something better? Yeah. But is your better actually optically better or just easier to use? And hopefully the answer is just easier to use, otherwise I should just sit down. <laughs> um, so this is an example of a microscope here with an XY control on it, and you look at that and you say, oh, well gosh, we should be able to automate that. So the Micro Gigapan adapter kit was born, and we had these design goals. I had these design goals at least, which I think I had consensus. One was don't change the microscope. People don't have authority to change things. In the one lab that those were taken from, the person who took me in there was using someone else's microscope. They weren't really, like, there were power and whoever has issues, and teachers certainly can't change microscopes. You can't go drilling holes and stuff, so can't change the microscope. That makes it actually a lot harder to mount stuff to it. I wanted an open source design, and I wanted it to be repeatable. And we can go into that in a lot of detail. So right now, I have a complete working rig I, with 
uh, appropriate credit to Jay for a whole lot of work and to Gene for debugging um, some of my software things where left and right became confused. But it works on one microscope, um, one particular brand. We're working to simplify and to generalize the design. Most of the components, I think, need minor modification, and we're using an environment where we can rapidly prototype and create new examples. If someone sent me a microscope that was like the picture a few back that had an XYZ stage in about the right place, I'm pretty sure that I could make it automate in the same way in a smallish amount of time. Um, so, oh yeah, that's contact with your in, in, instrument. So what I want us to be able to do, among other things, is capture and share the transient experience of scientists. So what does a scientist do with a microscope? Well, the, there's some different things, but one of the things that happens is, um, in um, the one case is they, we have river ecology specimens that take 10 or 20 minutes to prepare, great, and then a trained observer who's really fast takes 40 minutes to an hour of looking at the specimen, taking pictures, going over, taking a picture, zooming in, taking a picture, doing exactly the thing that we want people to do with gigapans. You look at a gigapan, sorry, you look at a picture, you look through the microscope, and then you can explore that by moving in X and Y, right? So that's exactly the same thing as you can do with a gigapan. But what if we can put that specimen in an automated instrument, which we can, capture it, put it on the gigapan site, and then let whoever you want look at it. Assign one slide, one image per student to count the diatoms in it, to count the pollen grains, to count the, I forget the name of the dentist told me, the bee disease that you can, anyway. <laughs> but you can distribute that across people. We can then, and even aside from that grand vision, you can distribute it across your lab and your comfortable chair in your desk with a nice monitor so that you don't have to do everything looking through even a good instrument. So this is the picture of the rig so you can have an idea of uh, the one out there is a teeny bit cleaned up. And then we'll go into details. So what do we need to do? We need to control focus. Turns out almost all microscopes have this common interface because we like to put our hand on the table and turn knobs. So controlling the z-axis so we can capture multiple images, the focus stack engine talked about. Then we need to do xy control, some variations there. Um, and then we should automate this. And then there's a bunch of software and stuff, but that's common to all our platforms, and we'll talk about that. So focus stacking, just as a fun example, this little rock slice through a microscope. Here's the top slice. Here's the bottom slice of 32 images. And there's an in-focus image. This is not a gigapan image, it's just one up and down, because I made up and down work first. Um, this is actually 12 bits, um, literally, of a ferrite core memory board. So, um, <laughs> it's cool from an old tech. Uh, fiber that you can tell that this is worsted cloth, because one fiber goes under two others. Um, two pieces of origami paper. So our z-axis, here was um, one, one prototype we made. It's the little thing sticking out there is a stepper motor, can slide up and down, so we can fit it to a variety of instruments. And this one has the NASA logo. This is the one that's actually in use, um, that Jay designed. The same basic idea though, we're moving up and down the stepper motor so that we can control a knob, so we can do what you do. And here's an example of a knob, a pore, this is from one of the poor little orphans with, uh, in this case, the fine focus knob is on the right. It's, you know, pyramidal in shape. How are we going to fit something to that given the criteria of don't change the instrument? Well, one, one thought was um, cut out acrylic rings, glue them together. They can be in descending in size. Uh, Double-sided foam tape works. Um, they have a, some other prototypes of stuff. Another, this does involve breaking rule one, modifying the instrument, it, but this works brilliantly to connect a stepper motor to a shaft with a little bit of tubing. And it works as a, a clutch as a, so that you don't stress the bearings on anything. It, it works magically. But it broke rule one, so it's kind of a fail. <laughs> but it is what I'm using. Um, XY control. 
this is a little um, uh, CNC table. It turns out that if you call something a microscope stage, it costs this much money, but if you call it a hobby XY stage, it costs that much, even if the resolution is similar. In this case, um, a turn of the dial is a millimeter, so you can actually have pretty fine control of things. And I believe, last I knew, that um, uh, Michael Andre was using this to, under his dissecting scope with his B abdomen dissections um, so that he can have the B in its, its medium. And when he would move it manually, it would jostle and move thing, the guts all around. So this way we have controlled movement. It's completely manual. Don't discount manual control on everything. We can do most of what we're doing manually. So if you have a gigapan and it's like, oh, it's not taking, try and do it manual. Except robots are more fun. So use the robots when you can. So here's the, next, the detail from the side of the XY stage control showing the motors, showing little timing belt pulleys that move the stage in X and Y. Uh, shiny little um, acrylic design porn, sorry. Um, these are the rods to how do we connect if your rule is no modifying the instrument, how do you attach some kind of heavy-ish motor, mo stepper motors to a stage? Well, we use little all thread rods and the acrylic at the end is to hold it in tension. And this is all part of my how do we make it repeatable strain. I, I was actually one in my head, one of the things that I dislike about my idea of rings glued together is that that requires a trip to Tap Plastics to buy acrylic cement or to the other hardware store. I wanted this to be something where you can order it by having, aside from us making kits, which I think, you know, that's on the horizon, but you could make an order from a company, Ponoco, or any of a number of companies that will laser cut your parts for you. You give them a file and they send you back acrylic. You make an order at the hardware store at McMaster Car for all thread and the, the nuts and one to uh, SparkFun Electronics for the components you need there. I, I wanted to make it that easy and that, that fifth order to get acrylic. So I guess McMaster Car would have that. Okay, that doesn't break my rule, sorry, but it was a different medium. Um, more, so this is detail of how the stepper motors are coupled into the XY stage. And now we have a video of it in operation and talk about that at whatever level. It's taking a picture, moving the knob a little bit. It turns out that one, the stepper motors have 200 steps per rotation, which means that one step maps to, I believe a micron, but I don't think we have that resolution. I think we're getting about two micron resolution um, in the Z axis. That is to say, much greater in the control of the knob. It's not a micron turn of the knob, but that knob turn you know, is exaggerated. Now, just to wrap up really quickly on something that's kind of a problem is indoor gigapans in lighting things is kind of a pain. I, I have lots of gigapans that look like this where I was fighting light and failing. Um, this one was just, I was just trying to document this studio setup that I, I set up. I rented photo lights and I tried taking gigapan portraits. Um, well, you can get wireless triggers for your cameras. This was just on a G9. They fit on the hot shoe. The wireless trigger will then trigger a uh, something that a flash is connected to or a strobe device of whatever sort. You then can get these but just light. They look like light bulbs. You can screw them into your fixtures at whatever control you want um, in a room. So if you're trying to do an indoor space and it really matters that things are lit well, you can replace your light bulbs or some of them in these with these strobes that then are triggered by the flash and the speed of light being faster than the speed of shutters, that works. So your camera fires, it triggers one and they all trigger and you can end up doing actually well lit indoor spaces, which, um, and outdoor actually if you have big lights, um, which was awesome. And I did that to do portraits like, um, this is an ear and that's the full thing or a little thing on a hand as part of a bracelet. So the idea is you really, as Richard's saying, what does a panorama mean? Um, I think you should.
do lots of things. And so here is this metaphor. It turns out when you look at wool, you see weird things. And so this is the wool bear who, who symbolizes our project as we climb the strand, the fiber of. Finish the metaphor for me. <laughs> Thank you. It actually has all of our stuff on it. Yeah. Uh, well, I don't really have as much of a philosophical discussion or of a technical discussion that I've been doing, but uh, all worthy. So I've been uh, modifying some microscopes, um, some existing equipment. Uh, so presented in terms of scale. Um, here's an optical microscope that I've been working with in my lab. Um, it's uh, not really used very much and it's got this really nice XYZ stage on it uh, that gives us really precise control. And so basically it's just a matter of programming these devices and interfacing with them to uh, capture these gigapixel images. Um, and so that's one of the things that we're working towards in the software development is uh, making it possible to interface with as many devices as possible. And, uh, and taking advantage of this equipment that may not be used as much as it could be. Um, so this is a pretty nice microscope. It has uh, both incident lighting and uh, transmissive lighting, and you can kind of get an idea there. Um, I just want to show a couple of the images that have been produced. Oops. Ooh, what happened there? Um, so this is uh, an growing egg yolk, and it's about four gigapixels. So you can zoom way in. And see all sorts of cool stuff. Uh, there's some other images that we've taken that show you know, cells dividing. So you can really get a nice feel for you know, the big subject and small things happening within the subject. Um, this kind of thing is actually being done already to some extent, uh, particularly in pathology. There's slide scanners available, but they're very expensive. Uh, so this is kind of, you know, another approach. Uh, so how do we go back? Sorry about this. Um, so there's some pros and cons of uh, this particular equipment. So um, using a, an existing microscope is nice because it's a well-designed imaging platform. Um, you've got refined optics so that uh, you know your image is distortion-free. Uh, there's often lenses with you know that fix chromatic aberration and so on. Um, they're usually very stable systems, so you don't have to deal with vibrations as much. Um, but of course, you're limited by you know the specimen size. Uh, they're also very nice because there's many different lighting options or techniques. Like you know, I've used both transmission and reflection. Actually, I wanted to show another reflection image. Um, there's dark field, light field, polarized, phase contrast. You know, there's a bunch of different techniques that you can do, use and take advantage of. Um, uh, and compared to another system I'm going to talk about, it's relatively fast image capture, you know, several megapixels per second. Um, and they're relatively easy to adapt for gigapixel imaging, assuming you have this XYZ stage. Um, the cons, of course, as we've discussed before, is that they have a limited depth of field. Um, it is actually pretty time consuming as a result of this to capture one of these images, you know, several hours uh, because you're capturing thousands of images. Um, and 
you know, at the moment it's tedious to set up the panorama, but you know, we're working on developing the software to make it easier and more intuitive. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is uh, this other microscope that I've adapted, um, which is a scanning electron microscope. Um, so this is actually backwards chronologically. Uh, this was developed first, and I work in a nanotech lab, and I was you know, chatting with Rich a lot, who works on the Gigapan project, and it just kind of clicked, and it made sense that, you know, why don't we enable these microscopes to do the exact same thing? So uh, I was able, we were able to put this together really easily. This is one of the Gigapan beta units, uh, disassembled and just physically attached to the XY knobs on the scanning electron microscope. So you can kind of see it there. It's in the bottom corner. Um, these two stepper motors are just plunked onto the, uh, the control knobs that you normally just turn. Uh, so this can produce images like this. You've probably seen this once or twice already. This is a, a barnacle on the shell of a crab with diatoms on the barnacle. Uh, it was 300 megapixels um, and 384 images. And, uh, it was imaged by Molly Gibson, who spent a lot of time uh, working with these images because we didn't fully automate the system. So it was only progressing the XY stage. It wasn't actually triggering the camera um, because of the complexity and in interfacing to the devices. Uh, I'm trying to find the image to actually zoom in on it. So the print was really nice last night, but I felt like you couldn't actually zoom in and see some of the stuff as well as I'd like. So here's kind of an example of really being able to dive into it and see these diatoms. You can see a little bit of stitching errors here, but um, you know there's ways of improving that. And Randy and so on are making the uh, stitcher better and better. And it's really just a whole nother world. This was a really fortunate specimen because uh, Molly and I really had no idea what we were doing. We were not microscopists or biologists, and we were just finding stuff. And we found this crab and had no idea what we were going to find on the crab, or on the, on the barnacle of the crab. Uh, so anyway. Um, and again, this instrument has some uh, advantage and disadvantage uh, over other techniques. Um, one of the main advantages is that it has a super large depth of field. So you know the wavelength of the electrons is much shorter. So you're able to see a lot more of the subject. And as a result, you don't have to do focus stacking necessarily. Um, has well-designed imaging platform, often includes precision XY stages inside of these instruments. So it's just a matter of talking to them and getting them to do what we want. Um, you know, refined optics again, uh, electrostatic lenses. And they often have additional measurement techniques, uh, such as elemental analysis, EDS. Um, some of the cons are that they're you know, complex, they're costly, and they're less accessible to people in general. So um, you know, if you have one, you may not be able to modify it. Luckily, I was able to play around with this without you know, destroying the equipment. Um, another con is that they're, the image capture is pretty timely. So unlike the optical stuff that we're doing, uh, at least this microscope had a one minute per megapixel image capture rate. So you know, it takes a you know, ridiculous amount of time to capture these things. And actually, that kind of offsets the large depth of field. So, the amount that you're saving for that is kind of eaten up by this. Um, another critical problem is that there's some variation in the illumina illumination source. So this microscope had a thermionic emitter, which would degrade over the course of 20 or 30 hours. So it could easily degrade as we were taking the images, which was a problem. Um, there are uh, field emitters, but they suffer from other problems like absorbates. Uh, but there may be solutions to these problems. And there are actually other SEMs out there that are doing similar things, but um, for some reason I haven't seen many pictures produced from them. So 
I feel like you know it's still somewhat novel. So anyway, thanks. I should mention while uh, John's setting up that uh, you know uh, Jay was talking about the capture rate. So across all of our systems, we're using the same cameras to do kind of comparative tests and so forth. So we're usually averaging about 1,000 to 1,500 images an hour, and um, that's completely. So we, it's nice because it's completely automated. We go eat dinner, do whatever we want to for for a while, or come back in the morning. Um, so. Uh, Wanted to mention that, and also the fact that we are uh, all going towards the point of making this all available to everyone to to do. So on the wiki, that has some in information on how to start using the software that we've already been using, and uh, and then uh, uh, shortly we hope to start to uh, bring units that you can have in your own lab and, or and or kits and or software to enable. Thanks. So. Yeah. so yeah, actually, adding something to that, um, you can, with software that is out there, uh, th that exists right now, take the microscope images uh, with more or less patience um, right now. In the early part of the summer, Molly was using the microscope that I adapted and was taking focus stacked images by turning the knob and clicking the shutter and turning the knob and clicking the shutter. So you can do that. Look up focus stacking on Wikipedia and that's that's like the easiest thing, I believe, the, the easiest big win because the microscope's field of view is really hard. But then she was also able to keep track of, for slightly larger subjects, but still microscopic, turning the XY stage and keeping an eye on the index and then coming back. And she made some pretty big images entirely manually. So, you know, the, the software that stitches these, that does the focus stacking, that does the stitching is out there. You should, <coughs> you should make images even if you don't have robots. I, I actually just want to add briefly to this discussion with a little bit of philosophy and then a couple of oblique footnotes to this whole experience from my perspective. This has been really strange for me. You people are strange to me. Uh, I'm a bug guy and I work on mega diverse lineages of insects in a very large natural history museum. And what I see in front of me right out here and what I know is right over here are incredible resources to leverage the information that reside in those big collections and in our own backyards to do amazing things. And the magic of it, and I know that all of you will think, well, the next three or four little points that Dr. Rollins is going to make are ones that everybody knows, but I really think they're emergent properties of this gigapixel imaging thing that's going on all over the place, and they're general to every single talk that I've seen given, every presentation, every set of comments. It's all about things you know. In other words, rendering reality into virtual entities, the image. And that virtual en entity, that virtual specimen, we'll call it, from the macro one specimen at a time perspective, really has some amazing powers with regard to understanding nature. And uh, it's all about exploration and discovery. That goes right down to little tiny kids working. At, I mean, kids are totally, little kids, totally fascinated by zoomability. And the, the website, actually, the GigaPan website is, is a toy. I mean, and I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean that in a very kind way. And it's all about archiving. In other words, keeping a record. And it's especially, when I say archiving, I don't mean uh, like in the sense of an art museum. I mean taking information that's explicit and exacting and putting it in a format that everyone can get to even though not one human entity has ever observed that particular detail. In other words, you can, you, you can have a gigapan and explore it again and again and again because, and we'll find different things because you change and observers change. What you bring to the experience or the interface with the gigapan changes what's archived. For a guy in a museum, I'm worried about curation. Call that arranging. Arranging things in some useful or 
uh, or meaningful way so that I can better understand relationships and that I can recover those specimens in the collection. Certainly at several scales, at the level of an entire drawer, at the level of individual specimens, at the individual of character systems like just the pernotum, we'll need that one, Gene, because indeed I forgot to mention that the food residue does look like a pernodal shield from, uh, from one of the common pyroloid moths that are in green stuff, so probably was pretty protein rich. You should <laughs> dig into that. Um, curatorial things, that is being able to use the device as a finding tool and then also be able to control use of the virtual specimen with no danger of abuse. Because you've got to remember, and this is one of the lessons learned, that when you turn loose people who aren't experienced with handling the delicate wonders of nature that you've preserved in your collection, they don't always live through to another reality. They often lose their legs and their antennae and maybe their whole bodies and whatever. And you know you can beat up on a gigapan anytime you feel like. <laughs> Another important point that some people are coming to and that I think this group is coming to is linkage. By that I mean that melding where you move from one gigapan at one scale right into another gigapan at another scale. I don't understand why in actual fact with that wonderful and absolutely biotically rich barnacle that is made such great, why we don't move right over into the diatom and go right down one of the holes in one of those tests on one of those diatoms. We need to link with information. We need to link with text mappable data, measurements, the whole array of other information we need to link that system to. And finally, and, a, and this is kind of a sobering application of the virtual specimen, we need to get better at using these tools. Rich just gave us an interesting example of that by which a stream sample, for instance, of aquatic macroinvertebrates might be better assessed from a single composite uh, gigapan than it would be by laboriously fighting your way through specimen by specimen. What I'm talking about is utility of the methodology for diagnostics, for enhanced and improved accuracy of identification. Our fate may depend on it. Our group at Carnegie does a lot of work for the federal government and for Homeland Security, essentially, in looking at and searching for things that are unintentional or maybe intentional uh, introductions you know, the so-called invasive species business. So diagnostics becomes something that's useful. It, it organizes nature and yeah, these micro gigapans really are a tool for that with the mega diverse lineages of things, bugs and the like. I'm gonna shut up now and just tell you a couple of quick things though. I wanna say that this experience for me, an old man, um, uh, it's been a wonderful experience with this group of guys uh, because I had no idea when I started the collaboration how attentive to detail and, 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 and responsive to kind of task challenges this group would be. When I look at the little blue butterfly, I shudder because it's not well prepared. It was a practice specimen. Oh yeah, all those little worries. But you know what I really like about that? I like that very nice neutral gray background that goes all the way to the edge of the image. You couldn't believe it, we'd have Monday phone calls. And in those phone calls or in associated uh, emails, I would put down a whole bunch of stuff. I do a lot of technical editing, so I'm very sensitive to exactly what you do and how you do it with regard to handling images. And it was like magic. You didn't have to say one of these things twice. Somewhere down the road, attention to that would emerge. Even to the point of that ultimate one challenge that every little stupid or inexperienced user People like myself say to people like you, make it happen with one push of one button. Finally, a really oblique footnote. I think this conference and my many years from me meeting Ila when he was in his boyhood, long before the gigapan was a twinkle in anybody's eye, <laughs> I, I have been very impressed by the use of the methodology the, the, the development ideas, the interactions that occur as being a really a quite a manifestation of the desire for this group of people to do something good in our worlds, all of our separate worlds, and maybe even some planetary and extraterrestrial ones as well. But there is an interesting thing about this group. It is doing good in our world, and I say bravo.
Thank you. Yeah, so the answer is yes, I did, and I did flip, have to flip one of the sides to make it actually match up. Um, uh, so there are definitely challenges to uh, photographing more spherical objects and so forth. I think you know you can do that. We, we try to test with another beetle to photograph just six different angles of it and put it in one gigapan, and that was kind of interesting. Um, so there's different ways to maybe approach it. I could see, uh, I could see a time in probably the not too distant future where you can take multiple gigapans, register them within another gigapan, and start to do that matching and that alignment in a much more seamless process. So the, the demo you saw there, yeah, it took a little bit of finessing to get that to work, but I could easily see that leading towards uh, kind of a pretty friendly user system to, to, to uh, regis register different, different views. So, yeah. Can you tell the stage? Yeah, the answer is it's certainly possible. Um, there's, there's a, this system here is based on uh, kind of a CNC three-axis setup, and there's tons of CNC setups that that are designed to have uh, the rotational axis in different directions as well. So well, it's it's it's, it's tilt the you could tilt the camera, right? Right. Right now you can adjust these legs and you can tilt it and you can rake it rake the, uh, the, the, the adjustment of it to, to have more particular tilts and angles. It's a manual setup right now, but it could be automated in some way. Yeah. Um, but two other notes on what you're saying. So when Gene took an image of a, of a whole B frame, you actually have to, when you took it straight down, tilt the camera slightly or tilt the B frame slightly because, I didn't know this, but the honeycombs are at an angle so the honey doesn't pour out, which sort of makes sense. <laughs> so that was one element. The other is that um, there's, there's a whole lot of well past the experimental work on reconstructing 3D models out of um, focus stacks. So because the focus stack, I mean focus stack is really, I don't know, fascinating, but you are able, since you know which part of the image were in focus at each level, for solid subjects at least, you know its height at that point. And so the different focus, some of the focus stacking software extrudes 3D models that are of greater or lesser utility? The, um, there's a number of different stacking softwares. The one that we're using in particular right now a lot because of its quality in batch processing is called Xerine Stacker. And uh, that's developed by a guy that runs photomacrography.net. And that's, that's a really excellent resource uh, as well. Xerine Stacker, Z-E-R-E-N-E. -E -E, and photomacrography.net. And in his program in particular, he has a, you can output stereo pairs of a single stack. We're going to talk with him and see how we could do that of an entire gigapan, but um, he's already set that up to do stereo, stereo rocking and stereo pairs and so forth. And then Helicon Focus is another commercial package and you can output a 3D model, you can output that, but again, of a single, just a single stack. So, yeah. Thanks guys. Okay, thanks.